for that song as well. Well, if you would, take your Bibles over to the book of 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians. I appreciate this particular day. I love new beginnings. How many here like new things? You like new things? I love new things. I love the smell of a new car. I love the smell of a new house. Man, you think big, huh? I love the smell of new things. Something new, something special about new. You know, you get a fresh start, you get a clean day. I love the morning. The morning is my favorite time. I feel like I get a new day. I wake up, I love to see the sun come up, and I'm an early morning guy. I'm not a late night guy. I don't like, I'm not a night guy. I go to bed with the chickens, my grandmother used to say. She said, I'm going to bed with the chickens. Some of you older folks might know what that means. Some young folks think you're crazy. But I uh, went to bed with the chickens. But I love to get up in the morning. I love to have a fresh start. I love something new. And today I feel that way. I feel like we got a new start. We got a blank page. We get to start it new and fresh and clean. And I get to launch out into a new year, 2015. I hope you have expectations of this year. I trust you. Not let it just be a redundant year, just another year. I hope you don't think that way. I hope you don't think, ah, just another year. I hope it's not that way. I hope you think you get a new new year to live, a new day, and renew it. I trust that'll be the theme of this morning's message. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I feel that way. I feel a newness, I guess, if you will. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm going to start reading in verse 19. To give you the message I feel like the Lord has for us on this first Sunday of 2015. The Bible says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To be the weak became I weak, that I might be gained the weak. I made, made, made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Verse 23 is the reason or the goal for this message, but that I might do it for the gospel's sake. I might die to self. I might be a person that is given to God. Why? So the gospel could go forth. Verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do it obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep my body into bringing in subjection. Lest by any means that when I have preached others, I myself should be a castaway. Well, this theme in these few verses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 about running. I feel like the Lord wants us to go through this 2015 with this one theme, with this thought, with this idea. This entire year is we're running a race. We're running a race and it's called life and we're only get one chance to run this race. You only get one lap around this thing. You're not going to go back, and you're not going to rewind. You're not going to go back to a certain time. And I read the Bible, and it says one day is a year, a thousand years. And when I read that, I think, you know, yesterday uh, it, it, it might as well be a thousand years ago. You woke up this morning with a fresh day, and tomorrow you'll wake up tomorrow, Lord willing, and this day that you're living in. Right now, will be as, as of a thousand years ago. It won't matter in the sense of can we regain it. All you have is right now and what's ahead. We're running a race called life. Speaking to my wife this morning about a race, and she's preparing to go uh, in, very soon in March, I think, run a half marathon with her family there in Nashville. And so she's, of course, been running and training and preparing. And well, I think about running a race, and you know, there's so many things in the running race. You might die to self. There's a self-denial when it comes to running. Paul is encouraging here in this Corinthian church. This particular church is a very carnal church. If you'll study the Bible and realize that when he writes to the church at Corinth, 
they're always in some carnal activity. They're always doing something they ought not be doing. There's some vile sins that you're committing. There's some, there's some sins in that church in Corinth that Paul is always dealing with. And he's always trying to correct that church. And he's always trying to get them to understand of their error. And so he's always writing to them. And he's always trying to rebuke them and get them right with God. And they're just living in sin and not doing that which is right. And so he's always writing to the Corinth and saying, look, you need to get right. You need to do this. You need to do that. And he's always trying to correct them. And finally, he finds us, we find him here in chapter 9 of trying to encourage them, trying to get them to a place where they'll run the race. Well, they'll get in the race. Well, they'll, they'll get fired up about running the race. And they'll get excited about what God has for them. And complacency is a killer. Complacency, well, it's just, it's just a mundane kind of thing. It's just redundant to do, uh, go to church. It's just redundant to read the Bible. It's just redundant to pray. And it's just repetition. And all that's just nonsense. I'm praying and been praying early this morning that God would awaken us that we're in a race. That we're getting ready to run. Dying to self is essential in running a race. If I, in humor, said this morning, we're going to take a few minutes. We're all going to run around the building. That's exactly what I would do. <laughs> yeah, all right. Me run around this building. You can't even walk around it. But you know, truthfully, I'm very, very honest with you, that's what a lot of people do spiritually. <laughs> you think I'm going to read my Bible this year? Oh, you don't say it audibly. You don't get up and boast about not reading your Bible, but really, in truth, that's what you do. Because we're not ready to run the race. We're not fit. We're not, we're not, we don't condition our body. We don't exercise. We don't do anything spiritually. And I'm, I'm relating something physical with something spiritual. Jesus did all that all through the New Testament. He did a parable. I love the parable because he would take something physical and he would teach something physical into something spiritual. That's a parable. That's what the New Testament calls a parable. And that's really what he's doing here. Paul's writing. He said it's like running a race. It's like you getting prepared. It's like you working out. It's like you getting in shape. And I uh, commonly try to run with my wife sometimes and that's that's a comedy show in itself for me to try to run with her. But we've been on vacation before and I remember being uh, somewhere at Dolphin Island I think one year and uh, she of course runs everywhere we go and so she gets up and going to run down the beach and run and so I said, well I'll go with you. Yeah, that's what she did. <laughs> really? I said, yeah. So I put my sneakers on. I've never run hardly any at all with her but I get out and I run a mile with her. Right there, you're supposed to go. <laughs> a mile, I ran a mile, man. So I'm running, and of course she she's gone. You know, I was like, go on. I good. So I, I did determine I'm gonna run a mile. Uh, I'm, then I'm gonna turn. I am gonna run back. But man, when I got back, of course she's gone. She's running. I'm back to the motel. She don't see me, but I'm like, I'm just breathing. But I me, mean, my legs and. Uh, Wow! Ah, where's the ibuprofen? I mean, come on! I mean, my body is not conditioned for that. But it's just a mile. Spiritually speaking, we're unfit Christians. We're out of shape spiritually. We we need, we cannot run. And and when you hear messages like this, you almost get discouraged because be like me, her telling me you got to run five miles. Well, that thing. Why? Because I have not made baby steps. If I'm going to run five miles, I first have to run one mile. If I'm going to run ten miles, I first have to run three miles. And before I can get ten miles, I'm going to have to start small. A lot of people get discouraged with Christianity in their life because they say, well, I don't really read the Bible. Just start out reading them. Five verses. Well, I don't read that. Well, start out reading two verses. Well, I don't really understand it. Just start somewhere. If you're going to get fit, you're going to run a race, you've got to start somewhere. It's going to take determination. It's going to take dying to self. Uh, Galatians 2.2 says this, Lest by any means I should run or have run in vain. Do you know you can live this life in vain? Let me explain that. You say, well, I've got a good life. I've got a good wife. I, I, I make a lot of money. I'm prosperous. We live in a nice house. 
we drive a nice car. I mean, you can list all kinds of things, but can I tell you, you can still run in vain. You can still live a life that's vain. What it means is it's not productive in God's eyes. See, I can be prosperous. I can be, uh, with my human ingenuity, I can do all kinds of productive things, but yet I can be a failure in God's eyes. I could succeed in this life. I could succeed in the, the things that I am involved in in this life, but in God's eyes, I'm a failure. Because I'm not spiritually minded. The devil has done a masterful job in getting us to think carnal and getting us to think uh, fleshly, getting us to think physical, getting us to think things that are temporal. We're all to be concerned about things that are eternal. He tells us here. In Hebrews 5, 12, 1, the Bible says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does severely beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I can't help but think of another one. I think lay away, lay aside every weight. When she runs, my wife does not run with 20-pound weights on her legs. And I know some people train in a sense of training to run, but you don't see runners running around with a lot of clothes on, a lot of baggage, a lot of luggage, and you don't see that. Why? Because they're trying to run a race. They're, they're getting rid of the things. I, one of the things I think of often as I went with my wife one year to the Nashville Marathon. She was going to run a marathon. And so I went with her to do it just before because I sure wasn't going to run with her. <laughs> so I'm there with her and she's in the G block. A, B, C. I mean, there's, I forget how many hundreds of thousands of people watching. There are like 80,000 running it. And G, she's in the G block. And G block is when that's the time you say you can run a mile. Or the, a mile so that it puts you in a block. So she's in the G. It takes her 30 minutes to get to the start line. And so she's got this bracelet on, and so that lets her know that's when her time starts, when she crosses that line. But the interesting thing about that race, I'm standing on the sideline, I'm taking a picture here, a picture there, and when the gun goes off, I'm not exaggerating. There was enough clothes thrown on the side of the sidelines to clothe this entire town. <laughs> There was hats and gloves and goggles and toboggans and sweatshirts. And I'm talking about it looked like foof, foof. when they crossed the line. Of course, it was cold. It was in March. So it was cold. So everybody's bungled because you're just standing. But when the gun goes off, man, I'm talking about poof. It's like somebody's closet threw up. <laughs> and they literally, the, the city of Nashville comes along and they've got a crew that just picks up clothes. What are they doing? They're laying away, man. They're getting it away. They're getting it off. Why? Because they're running. They're not going to be hindered by a shirt. They're not going to be hindered by something that would stop them. They're going to get rid of it. That's exactly what God's telling us in Hebrews. We're going to run a race this year. We're going to run a race for God. We're going to have to get rid of some stuff. We're going to have to trim off. We're going to cut back. We're going to have to do something. If you're just going to sit and not do anything for the race, you're going to run the same way you run last year. You're going to change some things. You're going to move some things around. And we get it right out of the text. Notice what he says. I'm going to give you the first thing on how to run. I've entitled this message, Run to Win. And I don't know about you, but if I realize and understand that if I've only got one race to run, I'm going to win it. Now, I'm not a huge sports fan, but I have seen some, and it always interested me to get down to the last few moments of the game. And what do they do? They play like some kind of maniac. Why? Because they got just a few minutes tied up. We're going to play this thing. I mean, we're going to do all we can do to win this game. We ought to have that mentality with Christianity. You say, well, it don't mean that big a deal. I mean, we got our whole life, do we? Well, I've got, I'm just 20 years old, man. I mean, I'm just 25. Do you? Do, how much life do you have? How, how, much, how many days do you have? Job 14 tells us our days are determined. Do you know you have a number? And we're just numbers in God's eyes. I'm glad I don't know my number. And I'm sure you're glad you don't know your number. But you only have a certain number of days. That ought to ignite something in us. That ought to do something. That does something for me to know, look, I've only got just a few days to serve God. I've only got a few days to run my course. I've only got a few days to run. 
Why walk? Why set? Better yet. Notice he says in verse 25. How in the world can I run? How can I make the most of my life? How can I do this? I want to know. How can I run and that I may obtain? It said in verse 24. First word is striver. Notice he says, And every man that striveth for the mastery. That word striveth give us the word, give us the idea of effort or purpose. I'm striving to be a Christian. I'm striving to be an employee. I'm striving. I'm working at it. I've got purpose. I've got effort. I'm doing this for a reason. I'm not doing it just for fun. I'm not doing it just because I think it's a good thing to do. I'm not coming to church just because I like coming in the building. I mean, there's a reason. There, there's, I'm striving. I'm working at it. I'm digging for it. I'm looking for it. I'm working at it. There's a striving that should be in our life. To sit down and do nothing. You know, one of my pet peeves is laziness. In, in, in the past, and I've got guys work for me and, and, and labor, and I thought, you know, I, I, don't, I don't do my, I'm not, a, I'm not a dictator when it comes to boss or, or whatever, but laziness just, whoo. Lazy just, ah, I can't hardly handle it. Hey, man, we need to get this, uh, we need to get this rock, uh, we need to get this dirt. Okay. Ah! I, hey, best way you can help me, just go sit in the truck. Just, just get out. I, I hired a guy one time. I'm not kidding you. Then I'm going to run a rabbit right here real quick. But I, we were going and got in the truck. The first day, man, he wore like a dog. What wrong? wrong? I said, man, this guy's going to be all right. I had a footer to dig, some, some foundation stuff to do. I had a lot of labor. So we get in the truck, and I'm not exaggerating. He gets in the truck, and before I leave my house, he goes, I was like, oh, it's early in the morning. You know, it's 9 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, no big deal. He sleeps all the way to Knoxville. Okay, that dude's tired. Yeah. I get to the job, he's never woke up. I'm working now. It's like 9 in the morning. Running machine, boom, digging excavator, bobcat, sound sleep. I go over, I go in the truck window. And stood in the neck. The little kid. He's alive. So, 10 o'clock, he's still asleep. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that dude comes out of my truck. What time is it? I said, Man, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He said, Why didn't you wake me up? I said, I figured if you that car, you need to sleep. Better yet, he didn't get another job the next day. Laziness. I mean, well, we ought to be striving. I mean, if that guy was hungry, if that guy wanted a job, I would say, work at it. I want to tell Christians, work at it. Strive for it. Dig for it. Grow labor. God said here, he said, if a man is going to get a mastery in something, notice what he says. He says a mastery, he is temperate. He's temperate. I mean, he's got some. He's got some drive. He's got some motivation. He's got some consistency about it. He said, "If a man striving for the mastery, I guarantee you, anybody in here that has had a, uh, has got a master's degree or some kind of higher education, you didn't get it sitting at the house. I mean, you studied and you strive and you work and you labor and you stayed up all hours of the night. Why? Because you're striving for it, man. That's what he's saying about a Christian." You ought to be striving. You ought to be working. I don't feel like getting up in the morning to read my Bible. Do it anyway! I don't really want to pray. Well, do it anyway! Can I tell you how many times that I hate to tell you that I've got on my knees and tell God, I don't even want to pray today. You know why? Because God said strive for it. Work for it. I mean, it's going to take labor. It's going to take effort. It's going to take energy. Striving. He likens it to this, this striving. Notice he, he likens it to people that live in the world. Notice he says, now they do it to obtain a crop of the crown. He says, you've got people, you know the Bible says the world is wiser in their own way than Christians. Now he's not saying in the sense of it. He's saying, you've got people that are lost that are willing to work harder at something that will waste away rather than Christians that work something for eternity. You got lost people. You got lost people that don't even know God that'll work and work and work and work for nothing. That'll burn up one day. But you got Christians that are not striving to know God and to serve God better this year. Amen. 
But we find it here. He says, strive for it. As a master of your temper, he says that you may obtain uh, not a corruptible, but an incorruptible crown. I'm looking for the incorruptible crown. Notice the second thing. I love this one, what God showed me. He said, if you're going to run, you've got to have to strive. You've got to learn. You've got to dig. You've got to work. The second thing he says to us, he says, I therefore so run. Notice this. Not as uncertainty. Now, this is the whole world of information for me. Uncertainty. Can I tell you this is not a joke? This is not a guessing game. This is not something that I think we just ought to do because it's fun to do. Buy a building. Fix it up. Have church. Do this, do that. That's not for fun. It's not a joke. It's not, it's not something that we got up one day and thought, man, I'd like to buy a building sometime and fix it up real good and see how old people get in. That's not it. The Christian life is a series of uncertainties. Salvation is a certainty. Service is a certainty. I get a promise. It's, when I read this, and if God tells me to strive, He not only says, I'm going to let you strive, but I'm going to give you some certainty for it. He tells us about reward. Oh, God was so kind. God is so merciful to say, if you serve me, I'll reward you. God is so merciful to say, yes, you can do that which is right. Yes, you can strive. And when you strive, you win. Isn't God so merciful? If I did not believe, if I did not believe two miles deep in my heart that what we're doing is affecting eternity, I'd slip my area boots on, throw my Herford saddle on my spotted mare, and I'd be riding horses today. But there's something real about this. There's something certain about this. Hey, God's in this, and God said, if you strive for the mastery, if you'll strive, if you'll run, you will get a reward. I mean, he said it so plain. He said, if you work at it, if you strive for it, if you labor for it, there is not some joke. It's not going to get the end of life and stand before God and say, oh, that's just a big joke. That's not it. It's for certainty. Paul said, I'm not doing this just out of uncertainty. I mean, how many people would get up and go to work Monday morning knowing, knowing that you didn't have a check on Friday? Well, you'd be a fun, wouldn't you? I've been in places and I've been to work for people that didn't get my money. Didn't pay me when I said I'd charge for this and that. But you know, God's not that way. God is a good rewards man. I love God's reward. Notice he says, I'm going to turn over, I'll just read some. But I'm telling you, I, I, I wish God by his spirit would give us the, the understanding to know how certain this thing is. Living like a Christian, living for God, serving God, is not just for fun. But there's some certainty to it. Psalm 19, in verse number 7, the Bible says, The law of, of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than they than gold, yea, than fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. In keeping of them there is great reward. There's God's promise. God said, you serve me. You do that which is right. You run in my race. I promise you, you'll get a reward. Man, I'm telling you, I'm fired up about this race. I, I'm fired up that God said, if you get in a race and you run, you run well, you'll have a reward. There's not for uncertainty. Notice he goes on to say, as one beateth the air. He says, I saw their run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Just for naught. Just, could you see a boxer? That's what Paul's saying. He said, this is not for, for fun. This is not, uh, I'm running. And I, I think about my wife running. And, you know, she don't train for a marathon not to go to the marathon. I mean, she's training to go to the marathon. That, that's, that's, that's the reward she's getting. He said, so I'm not going. I'm striving. I'm doing it for certainty. Notice the third thing. Here's the tough one. Notice the subjection. This is tough. 
But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Like you know what he's saying? I got out of the race. I quit. I quit the race. Paul is saying in a very powerful way, he said, if I don't keep my body <coughs> under subjection, when I have done that which is good, he said, I've preached. I've done right. I've served God. If I don't keep my body under subjection, I'll find myself as a castaway. That penetrates my mind. That, 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 that does something to me. Okay, I've got to strive. I've got to work for it. I'm in a race. I'm doing this for certainty. There's a certain reward in it. But I've got to be in submission. I've got to, I've got to, according to God's word, bring my body under subjection. Can I tell you, this is our protection. Subjection is our protection. When we, as Christian people, bring our bodies under subjection, we're really falling under the protection of God. I don't want to be a castaway. Oh, one of the things that penetrates my mind is hard even now. To think that I've wasted my life. And I'm not saying serving God either. I'm saying when we when you set out to serve God, you're not wasting your life. Oh, may the Spirit of God right now give us understanding about the one life that we have. One life. That's it. I want to bring it under subjection because I don't want to be a castaway. I don't want to find myself five years down the road. Oh, God, I cry out. Don't let me be a castaway. Help me to bring my body into subjection so I can run a race and so I don't get out and fall out and lay down and get out of the race. You know, living in sin, living, you know, you can live a life, live your entire life and forfeit all the rewards God could have had for you. Now, as I said about rewards, I don't, I don't live and do right, try to do right for God to get a reward. I do right because that's what pleases God. But in that, it's nice to know I get a reward for it. It's nice to know, and it's a merciful in God's part to say, look, you do right, you bring your body in subjection, you get rid of sin, you, you remove some of that sin out of your life, you'll get rewarded for it. One of the things I think hurts people in their Christianity is when they stop, if, if they're trying to get victory over some sin, what discourages people from continuing is they don't see the fruit immediately. See, if I stop something over here, let's, let's say, let, let's just pick something. I don't know, pick a sin. I need thousands of them. Pick one, and I'm going to stop it right here. Well, tomorrow, I think because I stopped it over there, I should get immediate results. It doesn't happen that way. It takes time. I mentioned a while back, I had a message a while back that I said there were things happening in 2010. 2010 that I'm just now receiving any kind of information about. I was thinking, I got up one morning and I was thanking God for this and all of a sudden it dawned on me that was put in place in 2010. I was thanking God that he allowed me to live long enough and stay close enough to him to see the reward of that in 2014, now 15. Living in sin will forfeit the rewards you could have won. And last thing, the subjection. But living lost, the only reward is hell. Could I tell you, according to God's word, hell can be a reward. So we're talking about <coughs> God rewards evil just like he rewards person that rejects Jesus Christ as their Savior 
He said, well, I'm a good person. I go to church. I've been baptized. And I'm a mature member of the church. But if you've never personally received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you die without Jesus Christ, your reward will be hell. That's what the Bible says. And I don't say that lovingly. I don't say that with, with funny. I'm just saying, according to God's Word, the reward is hell if you live lost and die lost. There's a protection here. God sets up a perimeter. He says, look, stay inside this. Do this, and you'll be blessed. Strive for it. You're in a race. You're in the race, regardless. You're running a race. You're running a race of disobedience. You're running a race of obedience. You're in a race, and it's called life, so you might as well run it. Well, if I'm going to run it, it's sort of like driving somewhere. If you're going somewhere, if you're in a car and you're driving, you might as well be going where you want to go. But you might just get in the car where you're going, I don't know, end up in the water. I meant to go to Michigan. That's what's going to happen in life if we don't learn to run the race for God. We're going to stand before Him. Very soon, I might add, we're going to stand before Him. And we're going to say, what was I doing? Why did I waste all those years when I could have been running? For reward. Oh, dear church, if I could admonish you, if I could encourage you today to set out to run a race for God. Take some striving. It'll take some labor. There's some certainty in it, though. Well, doesn't that comfort your heart to know that God said, I'm, it's certain, it's for certain that you'll get something if you'll run it for me. I think God's so merciful to say not only in eternity, we can get rewards here. You can have a blessed family. You can have a blessed church family. You can have all kinds of blessings here. Let alone eternity. We we'll just run the race. Would you bow and pray with me? Father, we come to you. Lord, my heart's even stirred more when I think about the race that I'm in. My little realm of racing here. The little realm that I live in. Father, I pray that you stir the hearts of your people. If there's someone here that has never trusted the Lord Jesus, Father, would you by your Spirit reveal that to them? Prick their heart, bring conviction upon them, let them understand and know that if they live and die without you, they go to hell forever. Father, let not that be the case. Intervene by your grace and mercy. Give them courage and strength to make that step today. And Lord, for sure, sure there's Christians in here that have not been running the race like they ought to. Surely, you are not giving me this message if it not be the case. You're trying to draw out a people that are running the race. Oh, Father, would you please move and work. I'm going to ask you, would you stand to your feet? I'm going to give you an opportunity to come. This altar is wide open. God's dealing with you. God wants to take my life. You want to come to the place as a place of prayer. If you're lost, you've never truly been born again. Today's the day. Today's the day. You walk down the aisle and tell one of us around, somebody around here's got a Bible love to tell you how to get saved. singing that song. If you want to fall in with him and sing it, take my life and let it be. It's on the prayer. Take my life and let it be. It's a prayer. It's really a prayer. God's a great
grace one time. Give it to God. I guarantee you, I promise you in the authority of God's word, you give your life to God, he can take it and do more with it than we could ever imagine. I can look back, and I'm so thankful. February the 22nd, 1998, I gave my life to God, and he's done something with it that I could never imagine. I would never in 14 million years imagine I'd be standing behind a pulpit preaching to a group of people. Man, God's good. Give your life to him. Run the race that he's got set before you. He'll do wonders with you. He'll do wonders. Father, we bow our heads to you. Lord, thank you so much for letting us even be in a race. Thank you so much for just giving us the ability, giving us the strength, giving us the information to run the race, knowing that there's a reward in it, knowing that you're so kind and gracious and merciful to give us a reward, filthy and rotten and sinful as we are, yet bless us and give us a reward. You're such a great God. So merciful, so loving, so tender and kind. Help us to get the race. This year, let it be a year of racing. We run that we might please you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. 3 o'clock, workers' meeting, and 5 o'clock, evening service. God bless you.